Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everybody, we will continue with lecture number 22 where we will talk about this uh, different idea of solving optimal control problems which is known as transcription method and followed by generic philosophy we will cover not too much detail into that and followed by we will go to a very recently evolving concept called pseudospectral transcription. So, essentially it borrows the idea from transcription method, but it is a different way of putting the problem in the in the framework. So, the solution can be very fast and hence uh, the claim is it can be done in real time actually. Okay. So, that is the very recent thing. So, we will see the, uh, the, the concept first what is transcription method and then slowly migrate to that and then follow up with some, some problem solution and things like that. The topics are like this, first you will see some motivation. And then philosophy of transcription method, which is uh, very different from, well, what I'm talking here is is direct transcription actually. Okay, so this direct transcription is slightly different from what you have seen before. And then followed by this uh, this pseudospectral transcription, we'll demonstrate the idea of pseudospectral using a toy problem first. And then we'll go to a real application problem and see how this is useful and all that. And remember, there are several 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 problems which have been solved by different authors. Uh, recently using pseudospectral and all that. So, we will not go too much into, into that and will list out a few references also for your further reading basically. So, let us see the motivation first and in a generic view, in a global view optimal control formulation can be thought of something like this. One is indirect approach, one is direct approach. In an indirect approach, we, we studied something like variational calculus uh, approach where it leads to this 2 point boundary value problem and all that. Whereas, in the direct approach, uh, we have this uh, this dynamic programming which we have already studied uh, and then we will have this this transcription method okay, uh, which are going to study today actually. Okay. So, all right. So, this, uh, this uh, necessary conditions of optimality through variational calculus if you see, uh, this is the idea of that that is developed actually. First, we have this dualization of the problem. That means, we have the state equation, but uh, along with the state now we assume another co-state equation, another set of uh, equations uh, of the same dimension like uh, lambda dot and all that. So, we have this uh, state equation uh, along with that is a co-state equation, there is optimal control equation which is stationary equation actually. Okay, which if you solve it, we get the solution of control as a function of state and co-state. Then associated there are boundary conditions and things like that actually. Okay, the initial condition is for the state and the final condition boundary condition either it is given for the state or it comes to this uh, transversality condition and things like that actually. Okay. Now, the question is uh, okay, we have gone through these difficulties and all that actually that uh, state equation develops forward, co state equation backward, it is a split boundary condition problem hence it is a two point boundary value problem all sort of things actually. Now, the uh, shooting method is one more one more method. So, before we have talked about gradient method and, and all that, but uh, shooting method is something like uh, something like this. The whole idea here is we have this initial condition of the co-state which is not known. So, we guess the co-state, initial condition of the co-state. Now, if you have initial condition of the co-state, then state and co-state equation can, can be propagated forward together with respect to that guess co-state value at T naught. And then we see, okay, when t goes to t f, your final value of lambda is somewhere here, somewhere here. Whereas the the boundary condition will give you some something else. Let's say that is here. So utilizing this error, whatever error has happened, now we update this initial condition lambda one to let's say lambda zero one to lambda zero two, and repeat the procedure. Maybe the next iteration it will go a little closer to that, and again uh, even update further, it will go further close to that, and then finally converge here. Actually, that's the whole idea here. Okay. So, if you do that, then what happens is the, the, I mean the difficulty is because typically co-state equation happens to be unstable equation and you are integrating the equation forward. So, we have this, uh, this sensitivity issue that means it is sensitive to the procedure uh, and essentially to the initial guess value of the co-state actually. Okay. 
and the typically the of the difficulties we cannot have a good guess of the costate because costates typically do not have physical meaning even though there is a little bit mathematical meaning that costate is nothing but the optimal if you have optimal cost already then uh, in dynamic programming sense lambda is del j by del x so gradient vector of uh, optimal cost but that does not help too much uh, in guessing a number for the initial condition for the costate actually. Okay. So, typically it is usually done through kind of a guess a control history some heuristic control or non optimal stabilizing control is used and then use that predict it uh, I mean use that control from the initial condition of the state both in the state sense remember these are co-state trajectory but you will uh, will operate on the state then finally you will get a uh, final state and once you get a final state you can evaluate this and then come back come back integrate the co-state equation backward and hence you get some sort of a information about lambda 0 typically it is done that way. Okay, the whole problem is costate equation is normally unstable okay, and hence the long duration prediction is not good. If anywhere there is an error here, anywhere there is, if you are not, uh, not very close to the real optimal lambda 0, okay, then we will have this difficulty of uh, error amplification very fast because the dynamic equation is, non, is unstable actually. Okay. So, typically non, non long duration prediction is not good. So, what do you do? we have to do this uh, idea of dividend rule that means instead of predicting for a very long time how about predicting for a shorter duration let us say t 0 to t f I will divide it to two parts t 0 to t intermediate t i something and then t i to t f sort of thing. Okay, so, this approach is called something called multiple shooting okay, you have you split the uh, duration into several segments like this and but when you do that it brings the additional constraint that okay around this point you have to make sure that this discontinuity does not come I mean this point uh, kind of uh, falls there same point as well as the derivative smoothness should also be there the derivative over here should be equal to the derivative there at least the first order derivative actually ok. So, these are uh, these are some of the additional constraints that will put into the problem actually ok. So, these are uh, additional constraints at the joining points actually ok. But having said that if you put this conditions intact and then try to solve it and things like that it essentially leads to okay, this, this concept of transcription method this is a kind of a direct approach. In other words if you think think about a kind of segmenting it uh, to a large number of segments actually then essentially it boils down to some sort of a discretized version of the problem and hence uh, that is the approach of uh, what is called a direct transcription method actually. So, this is the philosophy of direct transcription ok essentially it, uh, it convert the dynamic system variable into a finite set of, uh, set of static variables or parameters and then pose an equivalent static optimization problem ok and then solve this static optimization problem using this uh, the static optimization methods and essentially there are methods for this so called nonlinear optimization or nonlinear programming basically. So, use that uh, and then solve the problem for the static optimization framework actually. Then obviously, you have to assess the accuracy and repeat the steps if necessary and uh, there are uh, concepts like fine tuning the grid points and things like that. If the, the coarse grid point is not good, you have to go for fine, finer grid points and that is called mesh refining and things like that actually. Okay. All right. So, this is the whole idea of this transcription method actually. Now, in mathematical sense, what is the thing? We have this objective of uh, minimizing this, uh, the notations are slightly different here. Uh, okay but essentially it conveys the same message you have the you have to minimize this this uh, cost function which is a function of state in control both which is end point condition and there is a path condition subject to this this dynamic equation and with end point uh, this is the soft uh, condition for end points whereas these are hard conditions for the end point actually ok. So, end point conditions equal to 0 and things like that some functions of end points. Uh, Essentially, they tells that okay, the desired value can be fixed, initial condition can be known, things like that. All these, or everything will fall within this uh, this functional form if you write it that way. And there is also a path constraint which are not uh, discussed so far, but we will uh, we'll discuss one of the uh, for subsequent lectures, where this problem can subject to the state and control inequality constraints on the way. Basically. So, these constraints are also part of the problem formulation, do not forget that actually. Okay. So, these are this is how the problem objective is and the whole idea here is we select a set of grid points, discretize the state and control variables, convert the problem into a into a nonlinear programming problem and solve that problem and you should solve in such a preferably we should solve that in a computationally efficient manner actually okay. that is what it uh, the whole idea I mean 
uh, of direct transcription. So, to demonstrate the idea what you are talking here is okay, let us say assume that okay, time domain uh, is, is discretized into the several several points like that, here one, here one, here one like that actually. And if you have a continuous function like say x of t is some continuous function like this, what you are telling is okay, we select the value of x of t at that point of this and then here, then here and like that. So, then you will then you join it linearly basically. Okay. So, this continuous function is approximated by a set of uh, straight lines okay, or piecewise continuous function you can see that way. So, essentially approximate the trajectory that way and discretize the state equation. Okay. And also you can discretize the control variables as well, uh, similar to state variable you can do that, that also. Okay. Then uh, also we need an approximation of the integration of the cost function and we will proceed that uh, we will, I mean that is easy, but there are several improvements on that also basically. Alright, how do you mechanize this? So, this uh, discretization of the state you can very easily do that to using this Euler's method. In other words, if you take Tk plus 1 is Tk plus delta T or Tk plus H sort of thing. Then you get uh, something like uh, very very easily you can you can have a pair of x naught u naught x one u one and things like that for the entire domain actually. Okay, Euler method is is very easy because it all tells x of k plus one is x k plus delta delta t or or h whatever it is x. Okay, it tells that okay the if you have a differential equation x dot is uh, is f of x so let's say x of e u or whatever then x k plus 1 is x k plus delta t times f k of x k x k u k. Okay, so, that is uh, very easy to see all that actually. You can implement that and they have a set of uh, finite constraint uh, this is this will act as a constraint now uh, on those variables actually. So, the system dynamics is accounted for on the grid points basically in, the, in some sense. Alright, so this is how the way to discretize the state dynamics. So we got a discretized form of the state dynamics using Euler method. Let's say, so this is what is written here. And in the matrix form, if you put it there, then it turns out to be something like this. And the approximate the the integration is something like this. Suppose you want to there's an integration that needs to be done. Okay, this L. Okay, and this is also like uh, okay, you can think of this a small error here. You can, to make it compatible, you can think that this is not f, but this is l actually. Okay, so, this is l. Okay, so, you can and all these are also like l basically. Okay. Anyway, so, that is a way of uh, implementing the um, uh, trapezoidal rule really, but things may, may be different also when you know everybody does not have to use trapezoidal rule per se. But to to visualize the concept, actually, so you can see that okay, state equation I can uh, I can discretize using Euler method, and cost function I will discretize using a trapezoidal rule. Actually, then it becomes uh, easy problem sort of thing. And the the entire set of state equation what you see in the grid points can be written in this form, okay, in that that side actually. The endpoint conditions also you can put x of t naught is a, if you put a grid point at the initial time in final time, then directly values are known to us. Then path constraints are also given. Okay, these, these are the path constraints that needs to be satisfied. Remember, all these things are now converted in the set of discrete form, okay, discrete variables really. So everything will happen good in a discretized sense sort of thing. Okay. So then you you have a set of set of compatible. I mean, optimization problem for the static programming sense. We have this discretized cost function to optimize. Okay. Subject to this equality constraint. And subject to this initial final condition constraint, and subject to this path constraint, everything are in the everything happens to in the form of discretized variables actually. So now we have a compatible uh, nonlinear programming, and hence we can excite any of these uh, these uh, techniques which are uh, which are available numerical techniques and all that to solve this problem actually. Okay. And uh, just to recall, you can somebody can think of uh, utilizing this MATLAB optimization toolbox and things like that actually. Okay, this is this. There are toolboxes. Uh, there are various other toolboxes available in the market as well, other than MATLAB. But MATLAB also has this this fmincon function and all that, which I have discussed before. Those things can be excited to to have a solution of these discrete variables. Remember, you are not solving a, a continuous optimization problem. You are solving the discretized optimization problem really here. 
then there are uh, various various ideas about that. So, the how to do the better approximation of the state dynamics, although integration is not good. You can think of uh, higher order finite difference, you can use uh, the RK4 methods or uh, sorry RK methods, RK2, RK4, things like that. We can use polynomial approximation in segment, the, the Zermite polynomial and things like that. Coming to the better approximation of cost function, you can use higher order approximations or you can th think about using quadrature approximations as well. These are uh, mathematical, mathematically more powerful actually. Okay, you can also talk about finite element approaches nowadays and, and many different variations around that. Okay. So, in general, so one can think about improving the accuracy using higher number of grid points. Okay, and then there is this indirect transcription method, okay, which is always there with us, which is going through this this uh, dualization of the problem through this lambda dot equation, and then using some sort of numerical procedure for that. And uh, th that's the real indirect. So we are talking about direct uh, transcription method here. So that's not that much relevant here. But ultimately, remember, even if you go for indirect transcription, it, uh, what you are getting solution is for the grid points only. So that is our uh, I mean the restrictions rate, let us say. Then coming to the computational efficiency point of view, people can think of using sparse algebra because if you see this matrix, okay, lot of zeros are there actually. Okay. So, because of this lot of zeros are available, I mean it is appearing naturally why to do zero computations, I mean 0 into 0 is 0 all the time. So, then this, uh, this sparse algebra can be excited to speed up the algorithm and then also you can excite this, uh, this mesh refinement ideas. Okay. So, this uh, First, you solve this with a coarse grid, minimum number of number of grid points being less. You, you solve it, and then uh, increase the number of grid points, and then subsequently increase it further, then things like that. So that's the idea of mesh refinement. If you do. So initially, you will not waste too much of computational time, and uh, for working directly with some sort of a coarse, I mean, some sort of a fine grid point. Lot of grid points means large dimensional optimization problem. And you do not want to run into this difficulty of uh, large number of local minimum and then uh, issues like computational time and things like that. So, it is always advisable to start with a coarse grid and then go slowly towards more and more number of grids actually. So, that is called mesh refinement. Okay. Many references are available based on this, this whole idea of direct transcription. And uh, you can see many of these uh, little first thing that probably comes to my mind is uh, is this seminal paper which come uh, comes in eighty seven, and then a little more better explanation sense and uh, different uh, dif different problem and things like that appeared in ninety two which made it little more headway, and then uh, there are uh, I mean there are uh, several other papers available and uh, like uh, let's say this uh, survey papers and then the more elaborate uh, explanation and things like that available. You can see some of these, and especially the last one is also a very good one. In fact, the author has written a book, and he is uh, he has also developed a commercial software for solving this uh, this. Uh, I mean, industry industry grade commercial software for uh, solving optimal control problems using this this direct transcription approach. Actually, so you can see some of these the concepts out there. Uh, especially, you can concentrate on these page numbers about uh, well about fifteen twenty pages where you can get lot more insight into that actually. Okay. Anyway, let us come back to that and as I told in the beginning, we will concentrate on a different approach which is which has evolved recently over last 10 years I will say, uh, which is which has become very popular in uh, in aerospace industry especially in, in uh, USA because of several, uh, I mean several practical problems they have applied uh, uh, and then it has also been tried out in uh, international space station zero propellant maneuver and several satellite uh, minimum time maneuver and things like that actually. And now, uh, it has also been applied for uh, reusable launch vehicle uh, guidance applications and it has also been used in robotics, uh, collision avoidance, things like that actually. So, there are many things that is uh, that are happening recently. So, I thought okay, it is a good idea to see this, uh, this philosophy. So, that if some of you are interested, you can develop some, some affinity towards this and probably you can think of that as a possible research direction for yourself also basically. All right. So, we will go back to the problem definition and then, uh, then come back with uh, this objective. We have to, uh, we have to minimize this, uh, this cost function 
with the soft endpoint consideration i mean uh, i mean this cost function contains an endpoint uh, condition i mean endpoint function and a path dependent function actually and subject to this uh, the system dynamics with endpoint uh, boundary conditions as well as path constraints like this the philosophy here is uh, discretize the sets same as before as well as the control now using pseudo spectral method so we don't have to put blindly grid points and then try to discretize it directly sort of thing and what is pseudo spectral i will i will explain in next couple of slides anyway so we have to discretize it but discretize it in a different way using pseudo spectral method and so that you can convert the problem to a very lower dimensional nonlinear programming problem so the whole idea here is how to how to formulate an, a, a lower dimensional lnp problem actually so that it can be solved uh, much more faster okay and while solving you have to solve in a very computational efficient manner so various branches of mathematics will come together here and essentially it will uh, it will put together in such a way that ultimately it results in fast solution basically okay so let us see steps involved uh, uh, for this particular thing first of all you have to approximate x of t and e of t but how do you do it uh, something like this you you do that uh, remember this is this pseudo spectral method is is largely inspired from this uh, solutions for uh, partial differential equations also so the partial the one way of solving partial differential equation is through basis functions and all that so you use basis functions in one dimension and then leave the other dimension for converting for for pds to ods and all that probably that concept we will see towards uh, end of this course in one or two lectures but then we'll uh, right now the borrowing the same similar philosophy what we do here is first we approximate this uh, this state and control using some sort of basis functions phi n okay which is uh, phi 0 phi 1 phi 2 and things like that and these are typically this uh, this it can be polynomial basis functions for example power series and all that but that's not very effective so the study says tells us that uh, in in function approximation theory if you go to go, go to that side of the story there are uh, there are better function approximation basis functions like chebyshev polynomial legendre polynomial things like that they are essentially kind of power series but uh, come terms taken together and things like that actually okay so more on that you can you can study some math book legendre polynomial uh, chebyshev polynomial things like that actually okay so if you have that kind of thing then uh, we take a bunch of those and remember those polynomials have a nice form of recursive relationship so in other words programming sense also it can be very fast actually okay. so you go there and then tell okay x hat of t is something like this x hat is uh, an and u hat is vn something like that actually so these are uh, written like that in a finite number of basis functions this dimension can be different for simplicity of algebra sake we'll take it uh, something same but here it can be n1 here it can be n2 it doesn't hurt actually then you have to select a set of grid points anyway okay and i'll see uh, we'll summarize how to set a set a select uh, how to select a set of grid points actually okay now the how are these points selected and uh, and that becomes some sort of a question and then obviously it turns out that uniform grid point is uh, is not a very good choice so we'd have to opt for some of these so called non uniform grid points for see the whole idea is how to represent the same problem in a less number of grid points actually so is a large and large number of grid points is not a choice so we want to have as less as possible and in turns out that you can really do a good job with less number of grid points but uh, we have to compromise this idea of uniform grid point we have to go through this this non uniform grid point uh, gauss collocation points and things like that actually okay. so this uh, now discretize the differential equation using pseudo spectral method and that method turns out to be something like this we have this uh, this finite difference uh, pseudo spec versus pseudo spectral uh, thing okay that means uh, finite difference is typically not good so wh what you do is uh, this differential equation we do this this spectral discretization sort of thing so essentially instead of running into a large dimensional sparse matrix actually what you are looking for is a small dimensional dense differentiation matrix what is differentiation matrix is something what we studied just now this this form this is called a differentiation matrix if you if you see that actually okay so this can be defined as a differentiation matrix so instead of a large differentiation matrix with lot of zeros sparse sparse matrix what you are looking for is some sort of a similar matrix which will do similar job but we want a smaller dimension yet a dense matrix we don't want to see zeros everywhere actually
All right. So now we have to do this uh, this approximate the, the integral equation also, and that can be done using this this quadrature rules uh, for better better accuracy and all that actually. Okay. Now we have to use this uh, this uh, apply this efficient finite optimization. After that also we are not done. Remember that even though you have represented it as a equivalent smaller dimensional problem, still that smaller dimensional problem has to be solved as fast as possible. So you have to use this. Uh, this algorithms which has to be very powerful. Also remember that uh, as I mean whenever there is a uh, processor of capability of the I mean whenever there is an increase of capability in the processor that also comes very handy actually. So, in other words uh, going to this uh, this uh, computational advantage of modern day computers or modern day processors things like that uh, that also comes very handy. But it is not the entire solution. Solution lies uh, really in the good algebra actually I mean sorry good uh, algorithms really. Okay. So, you have to opt for something some some better capable algorithms to solve this NLP problem and always solving that on a on a onboard processor which is more capable is always better actually. Okay. So, this is all the whole ideas there and I will explain the steps little more clearly that here actually. So, how do you do for step 1? Step 1 is approximation right. So, how do you do approximation? Now, this approximation needs to be done in such a way so that the, the residual between these two whatever norm of that needs to be small actually. Okay. Now, how do you make sure that that is small? So, what you do this is already the approximation we have and now we define some sort of test function some other different functions the chi naught chi, chi 1 chi 2 like that actually. Okay. All right. Uh, so, in such a way that it is uh, well this is chi 1 basically. Okay. All right. So, this is we have to do it in such a way that uh, this uh, this residual error has to be minimum. Remember, this is an inner product, an inner product of continuous function. In other words, uh, uh, integral sense actually. So this inner product is defined something, something like this. You have uh, two continuous functions. Okay. So if you if you have two continuous function f1 and f2, then the inner product uh, between them is uh, some finite interval. Uh, let's say one t, then zero to t. Okay. Then f1 of t and f2 of t, dt sort of thing. Okay. So, that is what the inner product definition is that is what you are using here actually. Okay. All right. Now, the question is uh, you have a test function series, but what test function you will need to select so that the algebra becomes simple and it results in a simpler dynamics and all that actually. So, uh, one idea turns out to mind that okay, whenever you see an integral and all that uh, why why not trying out the delta functions. Okay. If you try out the delta function again if you put this uh, one of the function happens to be delta function then the ent entire integral happens to be just the function value basically. Okay. Sometimes people uh, I mean define this as without this this 1 over t is not there and if you have one of that as something like a delta function okay, delta of uh, t minus t n actually. Okay. Then what happens the, the entire integral ev evaluation turns out to be just f 1 of t n if t the only condition is t n has to be strictly lying between this interval actually. If it is one of the interval points, then it has to be half of that actually. Okay. Anyway, but uh, assuming that it, Tn is strictly inside this integral 0 to t, then the, the evaluation of the integral happens to be very easy and the, the residual happens to be the residual value at that point of time actually Tn. So, this, this is the whole idea there and then uh, uh, it brings in further simplicity and all that. Now, coming to the second point, uh, how do you select the grid points and this is a very nice uh, demonstration I have taken from most most of the lecture I have taken from uh, this material which is which this is a short course in, in IAA GNC which I attended myself. Some of the materials I have taken from that side to demonstrate it actually. Anyways, so this, is, uh, this is a very nice thing here happening. So, this, uh, if you see this function here and then just put uniform grid points. Then what happens here is uh, it, it is uh, is not happening. In other words, it happens up to this grid point. Let's say so to the in the center, it is okay because uh, whatever value you are getting, you are getting it there anyway. But uh, the function value of the, uh, matches with the, within that interval also. What, whatever points you are not seeing within that, there also the error is small actually within the, within this period. I mean the time interval. But as you go towards the boundary the function value is very different even though the grid point value is same. So, you use, so there is some sort of a aliasing or illusion rather basically. Okay. That means, the, the value grid point value is same as the function value, but uh, in between the grid point there is a large departure actually. 
So obviously this is not a good function approximation actually. But if you take the same same function and then do this, uh, I mean do this non-uniform grid point and things like that, you'll have uh, uh, you'll have lot better advantage actually. Okay. So these these grid points which are really non-uniformly located are typically called as uh, grid of collocation points or normally grid points you can so in a very loose sense you can call that way. So these are sort of typically done in a very non-uniform sense. This is something close here, something uh, close here, something maybe sparse here, things like that actually. Depending on there are several approaches again basically. Okay. So anyway, so this is uh, this is what you what you see here, and then what you, what did the the literature claims? That you have this, uh, there are several ways of selecting that. There are uh, something like uniform, then there is a Gauss union, Gauss uh, grid point, then there are Gauss radio grid points, Gauss Lobato grid points, various things available in the in the math literature actually. And uh, it turns out that uniform grid point is not good because uh, whether you have free end points or, or one end point fixed or arbitrary end points, nowhere it is approximate, uh, approximating in a good way. But if you slowly increase this, like you go to Gauss, Gauss Radau, Gauss Radau and Gauss Lovato, then it turns out that Gauss Lovato points will do a much better job in in everywhere actually. Okay, so now the uh, the recommendation always is go towards this this Gauss Lovato points actually. The exact formulas of that is always available in the literature. You can you can see it very clearly basically. All right, so Gauss is slightly better, but uh, don't stop at the Gauss level. We'll go go towards the Gauss uh, Lovato points sort of thing. Yeah. All right, so now coming back to approximation of the differential equation, here is something that we need to really understand actually. Let us assume that we have uh, done the, we have selected the uh, this one, we have selected the uh, basis functions, we have approximated that way, and we have selected the grid points also. Okay, now what actually? So what we are looking for is approximation of the differential equation. So we have this uh, state equation and control equation that way, and then equation constraints will tell us, okay, these are the constraint what is happening here. So I'll put it, I mean, approximate value, I'll put it here. Whatever I am approximating, I'll put it here. The dot, or that dot. Remember, this is the only function of time. This is a constant actually. So the this dot will reflect in this dot really. Okay, and then we have this uh, this quantity in the right hand side. Now, if you multiply with uh, with delta functions on both sides, then what happens is this fellow happens to be some sort of a number, and then you will end up with these coefficients only basically. Okay. Now, let us uh, let us see that in a little bit more elaborate sense. Let us take some sort of something like a Savice polynomial and confine ourselves to like five grid points only, just to have this uh, clarity of our idea basically. So we have this uh, grid. I mean, the nice uh, nice thing about it is, first two things you have to write, and the subsequent things you can write recursively. Ultimately, like it happens to be like this. Okay. Now what happens is x x hat of t. Let's say we we assume expand it this way. Okay. Right. And b hat is also. I mean, u hat is also expanded that way. So we are not telling that explicitly here. But then x dot of t, when you do that, then it is like t dot here, t one dot, t two dot, because a zero, a one, a two, these are our constant quantities actually. Now the good thing is, this quantities, once it is evaluated at a grid point, it happens to be a number basically. So if I if I look at this equation and at a particular grid point, let's say some zero grid point or whatever that is, zero is something like this, okay, because these num these are now numbers actually. Okay. Similarly, x hat of t one happens to be all these are numbers. And these are the coefficients, which is which are typically unknown. So what will happen in the left hand side? You will have a differentiation matrix in the form of these. Okay, but well, these are all numbers now. Okay, t1, t2, t3 are all grid points now, basically. Okay, and right hand side is also a number because ultimately you are you have this this grid point values are available, basically, right? So once the grid point values are available, those are those are become some sort of uh, numbers that are known. What are unknown is something like coefficients a not to a four and b not to b four. So this essentially, even though it's a differential equation constraint, it results into some sort of a algebraic constraint in the form of parameters actually. Okay. So if you consider the problem to be kind of unknown function in terms of a not to a four and b not to b four, and this happens to be some sort of algebraic constraint in the in the form of coefficient. In fact, in fact, everything happens in the form of coefficients now actually. Now the last one, uh, how do you do this discretization of the integral equation? Uh, you can do that uh, trapezoidal rule, but there are much better ways of doing that, uh, which is something like uh, quadrature rule, and that is uh, nothing but an approximation of the definite integral function, uh, usually expressed as something like a weighted sum, where the w i s can be computed appropriately depending on 
uh, what kind of quadrature rule you are talking about actually. Okay. So, ultimately it results in some sort of a discretization of the cost function also uh, because that is what we will need for the for the uh, static optimization problem actually. So, we have got a star algebra constraint which is converted into our it is taken care of the state equation constraint and here it is something that will take care of the cost function other things are fairly straightforward direct actually. So, finally, what we have is something like a discretized version of the same problem which, uh, which talks about this minimizing this cost function subject to this uh, set of algebraic equation now with endpoint conditions and path constraints. So, this problem uh, can be uh, I mean this uh, this optimal control problem has been now simplified to a lower dimensional nonlinear problem nonlinear programming problem and hence you can uh, you can talk about some sort of a nonlinear programming problem uh, solution techniques and all that to which you can uh, I mean use to solve this problem. All right, so this is uh, now to demonstrate in a small toy problem first, uh, and then we'll uh, solve it as a good application problem in mind of this lecture actually. Okay, first this toy problem, uh, we want to minimize this control u square uh, from zero to one, subject to this linear dynamics. So that is x x plus u basically with the boundary conditions like this, and the control happens to I mean, control constraint is given. The modulus cannot exceed one actually. Okay. Now, this this trivial toy problem is, is something uh, which interests me in a different sense. If you really look at the, I mean, this is a quadratic cost function with linear state equation and all that. You can actually go and, and scalar problem also that too. So we can actually go back to the closed forms equation. I mean, whatever we know already. Okay, assuming that this constraint is not there, let's say you see that actually. Assuming that this this additional constraint is not there, you can actually go back to real equation or whatever equation we already know before. Try to, to solve this problem. And interestingly, it turns out that the solution is nothing but u equal to zero throughout, basically. So if u equal to zero throughout, that means no control. The homogeneous solution happens to be the more optimal solution for this. And u is zero, obviously, cost function is zero also, basically. That's the best thing that you can also always uh, uh, have. I mean, without applying any control, you'll be able to do the job actually. But remember, this is an unstable problem. X dot is x x uh, x dot equal to x. Uh, I mean, plus x is actually an unstable problem. The trajectory will evolve uh, in an unstable sense actually. Okay. Okay. This is time, this is x. What you are telling is the initial condition is uh, is 1 and the final condition at t equal to 1, this is our final time. Initial condition is 1 and final time it has to go and, and go to e actually. Okay. This is a natural logarithm value okay, e. And you can see this, this solution if I take u equal to 0, I will end up with this and this this particular differential equation has a nice solution directly you can see that x of t is nothing but e to the power t into x of 0, but x of 0 is 1. So, this e to the power t. So, when t equal to 1, then it is nothing but uh, e when t equal to 1. Okay. So, we already satisfy the other boundary condition also x, x equal to 1 is, is nothing but t. So, these are all validation sort of arguments actually. Okay. So, what finally, what you are looking for is uh, we try to solve this optimal control in a discretized manner using pseudo spectral, but ultimately you know the solution and the question is whether you are approaching towards that solution actually. So, here you, you can take say we say polynomial of first kind, uh, there are second kind and things like that, but you have uh, taken first kind and you see this, these are also kind of polynomial expressions, but in a different sense actually. Okay. Each of the basis functions are different sort of polynomials themselves basically. Okay. Essentially, but if you put them together, essentially it is nothing but a power series basically. Anyway, anyway you can uh, you can use this and then try to go ahead and then uh, see this uh, this uh, shifted okay. One is uh, Zabitzer polynomial first kind, other one is shifted Zabitzer polynomial for the interval this that and all. So, details you can see that uh, in, in typically a math book actually. And the collocation grid points have been defined something like that. Remember, all these things, whatever you are talking, uh, I forgot to tell one point probably that, uh, okay, let me summarize it again. If I, okay, here we talk about 0 to t0 to tf, but the, the entire quadrature rule, grid point selection, all that we will talk about something like uh, minus 1 to plus 1. So, this scaling is necessary to make it uh, compatible with that actually. So, so, that is why the scaling is, is put here, this a plus b by 2 plus a minus b by 2 sort of thing. Okay. 
So, this is uh, this is these are the grid point grid point 1, 2, 3, 4, so you see how the, these things are sparse these are slightly closer to each other but these are further away actually. So, like that ok. Then you have this uh, this uh, state and control uh, approximated like this polynomial thing and if you see the d y d t of these ok, the it turns out to be something like this actually. Okay, you find out the differentiation matrix and equate the state equation at the grid point sort of thing. And then compute the T n matrix uh, something like this uh, T i and equate the state equation all sort of things we have uh, is the inverse of that actually T into D and then we put it there the, this this constraint what you see here can be approximated something uh, something like this actually okay, sorry this this dot equation and all that equation. Okay. So, again I, I do not want to go step by step here, but I think you can knowing the concept you can we can easily derive some of these actually. Okay, I suggest that you do it yourself also. Okay. So, that is ultimately the constraint equation turns out to be something like this actually. Now, we apply the boundary condition. So, we, we apply all these uh, grid point condition, boundary condition all that whatever we know here. So, ultimately this, this gives us this, this constraint equation that okay, these two constraints have to be satisfied actually initial condition and final condition. Now, the, this uh, this discretization of the cost function. So, we discretize that way where w's are selected as something like this, uh, all these numbers are, are given here and then it uh, results in a discretized uh, cost function actually. Okay. So, finally, we have this uh, this cost function to optimize subject to these conditions what you have here and uh, define the augmented cost function and things like that and then you can apply this KKT condition uh, Karus Kuntakar condition or any other static optimization technique uh, numerical optimization technique and things like that to, to solve this optimal control problem actually. Now, the solution turns out to be very very close to what we expect it starts with 1 and then 1 here 1 here like that, but once you put back the solution form remember there is a solution is a polynomial actually ultimate ultimately the solution is a polynomial what you are solving for is the coefficients n and b n. What we already know is the basis functions t n actually. So, once you know the coefficients actually we know the solution all over actually. Now, one idea is ok we know the solution for control you know the initial condition for the state. So, you can integrate it using r k 4 and then you get a different sequence of numbers and those sequence of numbers have to fall on this the this polynomial what you know actually. Okay, so, that is a validation technique. So, let us assume that ok that that exercise is done actually in a good way ok. So, anyway, so coming back to that uh, this is what it is this is the numbers that you are getting is for the grid points, but associated with that we also have a polynomial solution for this and it happens to be very closely there with respect to the exact solution actually ok. One is interpolated solution, one is collocation point, and one is exact solution. So, the all the things are together actually. So, that gives us lot of good confidence there. What about control? Remember these are numerical techniques. So, 0 is not really exactly 0, but the number turns out to be something like 10 to the power minus 3 which is which is very small very close to 0 actually ok and that is why it is not disturbing this the solution nature basically. All right. So, that is uh, some sort of confidence for for going further. And then what we do is we went to a little bit more realistic problem or something called front to back to turning of an air launch missile using pseudo spectral method. So, let us say how do you do that and what is the problem and things like that for rest of the time that I that I have actually. So, this reference actually we have recently kind of uh, presented this in this IFAC workshop uh, which was done in uh, in Bangalore right, right here in IAC actually. Anyway, this uh, this is the problem where you have a carrier aircraft uh, take, I mean taking a missile. Now, typically what happens is uh, this aircraft and the whatever missiles they carry they are all front looking. That means, any target that uh, that appears to the front side they can be launched and they can be engaged actually. But, what happens some uh, some target appears in the back then the whole idea of dog fight comes into picture. That means, this angle of, I mean this aircraft can increase its angle of attack. So, it increases its lift let us say and then uh, it also has uh, more drag. So, the speed comes down it goes up with a lesser speed by that time this goes front uh, and then it, it uh, does the reverse maneuver and that means, angle of attack it reduces it comes down again and so roughly it, it kind of uh, uh, it becomes behind the target and the maneuver that you are talking about first going up and then coming down and things like that this is nothing but a cobra maneuver. So, 
uh, I mean this these are typical terms used in the uh, air combustion area sort of thing actually. All right, so but that takes a lot of time. First, you have to go up and then increase your angular beta, go up, reduce, come back, and then align yourself uh, so that you look at the target in front of you actually. So by that time, target is not passive; it is also looking at you. You are remember uh, the for the target. If it is also happens to be an aircraft and all that in a in a dogfight scenario, you are already in front of him. Okay. That means this target has an advantage of firing towards the, towards the aircraft rather than you you I mean we getting an advantage to fire towards the target actually. So the the problem happens then that okay can I can I really not launch a missile here after all that's also an aerospace vehicle with larger capability because okay, aircraft turning is uh, much lesser capability compared to the missile turning basically. So this is larger turning capability. So I will launch it and then quickly turn it backwards. So that now I can uh, the missile faces the target and hence it is uh, it's equivalent to like a point attack basically. So the problem here is how to turn this from the from uh, I mean, turn this vehicle from front side I mean frontward going to the backward going side of thing. Okay, in other words, the problem is to reverse the flight path angle from uh, around zero degree to something like minus one eighty degree in minimum time. Okay. You cannot take too much of time to do the job also because the, I mean in a real combat scenario time is everything actually. So we turn it very quickly and then the problem our the turning problem ends here after that it can be guided it is uh, in a different sense actually. Okay. And also remember by the time we turns it cannot take too much of induced drag I mean turning also excites this induced drag concept and all that uh, any amount of turning has this penalty of uh, induced drag. So it should not have too much of that. Uh, so ultimately, what the constraint is, I uh, one gamma goes to minus one eighty degree. It should also have some some desired final Mach number, basically. Okay, so that uh, you can still continue to move towards that actually. Okay, so the problem is something like that. Minimize this uh, zero to TF difference. Uh, so minimize this cost function. Subject to the constraint that initial gamma is around zero, final gamma is minus one eighty. Initial Mach number is known, and final Mach number, let's say, equal to point eight, hard constraint actually. Okay. Uh, the problem is to reverse the flight path angle from zero to minus one eighty, maintaining the final Mach number of point one point eight, in, in, and it has to be done in minimum time actually. Okay. So the system dynamics is first, and we see that the vehicle once it is launched, it has to go this this kind of a thing. So we have this uh, this dynamics in this scenario. We have uh, some gamma coming here and some uh, alpha and things like that. So, and also there is a thrust deflection angle that you are assuming. Okay, the thrust is not happening in the body direction. It has to happen some sort of a, in a different angle direction sort of thing uh, that can be done typically through various mechanism of thrust defle uh, deflection. Can be some uh, SITVC side injection thrust vector control, or maybe some some fin deflection uh, at the end, something like that actually. Or there, the, there can be jet vanes or whatever it is actually. Okay, some mechanism exists so that the thrust can be deflected. So that actually augments to the angle of attack turning basically. I mean, thrust vector is a much more powerful vector. So if it turns, then the vehicle turns very quickly also basically in a way. And typically, these are not restricted to very low uh, low degrees also. I mean, thrust deflection angle that you are talking here can be a little bit higher than the than the alpha bounds and all that actually. Okay. Anyway, so you have this uh, this point mass equation v dot gamma dot h dot and x dot. So these two represent dynamic level equation. These two represent kinematic equations like that. Everything happens in two D sense here. Then uh, following this uh, this reference, okay, the idea here is to non-dimensionalize the entire problem, okay, so that the problem can be more and more generic actually. So we take care of that. Uh, first we normalize. Uh, I mean, they define these non-dimensional quantities. And starting from this, we actually write this equation. Now, m does m prime means uh, del m by del tau basically, okay. where tau is defined something like this. So we write it the same system dynamics in a non-dimensional quantity, something like this. And then remember, this is a difficult problem because uh, we don't want to excite this bang bang control and things like that. Actually, that's the open loop control. Actually, that way. So we have to, I mean, they again going by this idea which appeared here in this this literature. The idea here is to uh, convert this pre pre final time problem to some sort of a state constraint problem with with bounds on control, 
and then equation number one are formulated using using five path angle as independent variable basically. Okay. What you are assuming here is the turning happens in one direction only. That means the flight path angle is monotonic actually. So if you assume that, uh, then you can uh, take the flight path angle as independent variable, and this leads to this this fixed final condition where it talk the initial condition of gamma you know and final condition is minus one eighty degree. So it happens to be a fixed final condition now actually. For fixed final time sort of thing now actually. Okay. So that becomes uh, amenable for solutions using this finite time optimal control theory, basically. Okay. So the entire assumption boils down to that okay, flight path angle is monotonic uh, and continuous function with respect to time. So that is the inherent assumption based on which uh, can attempt to solve this problem. So now, when gamma is independent quantity, we have to assume this. This uh, first define this dm by d gamma is something by something like m prime by gamma prime dt by d gamma one by gamma prime like that actually. And then we have this modified cost function is something given like this zero to tf is equivalently written as uh, something like uh, d gamma integration of d gamma. But d gamma it is something like uh, dt has to be converted to d gamma, so dt by d gamma. But then uh, this is one over d gamma by dt and things like that. So, d gamma by dt is available from here. So, put it back here. So, j is available as some sort of a complex function, but ultimately it is uh, it is time minimizing cost function actually. Right. And then the, the, there is a hard constraint. So, m of gamma of has to be 0 0.8 actually. Then you go through this uh, this uh, long algebra of discretization uh, discretized mathematics to minimize this cost function quadrature rule. Okay. Subject to this uh, this uh, derivative approximation, subject to this uh, equality constraint equation, subject to this path constraint also that alpha cannot be more than 20 degree and delta cannot be more than 72 degree. That's what I told. Delta can be much more than the alpha, basically. Okay. So and essentially, when I mean, this endpoint conditions are direct, okay, m0 can be anywhere between 0.3 to 0.8. However, mf has to be 0.8. That's the problem actually. So, these are some of the experiments uh, you tried out with uh, various different cases and all that. So, remember uh, no matter wh whatever is the initial condition of Mach number, the final Mach number turns out to be 0.8 actually. Okay, so, this is a very nice observation first thing to see. And if you see the kind of height versus down range sort of thing, this is the trajectory that you see. So, this is launched from somewhere here and it all turns out, I mean it, it nicely turns where you want actually. So, the turning happens nicely basically. Okay. Then you have this uh, this angle of attack uh, constraint, uh, which is also more than twenty is not allowed. Uh, something like that. Uh, this 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 constraint is coming into picture, so that is a uh, enforced here. Okay. And uh, and this is all within the bound actually. Whereas delta b, which is also this thrust control uh, mechanism sort of thing, this is actually uh, helping that. To, to remain within the bound actually. Okay. So, delta b turns out to be like this, all our smooth trajectories uh, see that also. And then uh, the point here is uh, the final Mach number is 0.8 no matter where you start. So, velocity drop is not, not there actually. Then the well, Mach number versus angle of attack, something like uh, Mach number versus flight path, and angle of attack versus flight path, all the things you can plot in different, different variable sense and helps a lot of more meaning actually. Okay. And remember this has to be seen from the right to left actually, no matter what you start you all end at the point 8. Flight path angle evolves from 0 to minus 180 degree. So, this plots have to be seen in the reverse uh, right to left sense actually. Okay. This also has to be seen in right to left sense angle of attack, how it evolves as the trajectory. Flight path angle per time, how it evolves actually, then uh, this always uh, has this 0 to minus 180, but uh, depending on different cases, different things are then. How do you generate this plot by the way? Because once flight path angle becomes independent quantity, okay, okay, then time becomes some sort of a state equation. So, dt by dt gamma equation is also put into the problem formulation. So, corresponding to a particular gamma, you have the corresponding value of time actually. So, both are both cannot be independent quantities, only one has to be independent quantity. And so, according to the other, according to that, the other one varies actually. So, that is how the time is generated and it is plotted something like this here. Okay. 
So, now we can think of okay, effect of uh, reducing angle of attack and things like that. Uh, so, this is this depends on the shear angle again. If this uh, this is more that can be less and, uh, and things like that actually. Okay. okay. Now, this okay. What is shear angle and body angle? Like some of these things are aerodynamic concepts. You can see these are this is with respect to the body, if this is the body angle delta b and with respect to the velocity vector, this is a different angle that is shear angle actually, velocity vector and thrust vector that is the shear angle. That can be even higher than the body actually according to the diagram. Okay. All right. So, this is what it is actually. Then uh, effect of the reducing the angle of attack along with the flight path, I mean the all details are there in the paper, you can read some of the explanations there also. So, let me not too much elaborate here, uh, it is all happening in a in a good sense, you can plot flight path versus time, how it evolves, you can plot Mach number versus time, how it goes from 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 depending on, uh, on different cases actually. Okay. That means, we put various bounds on alpha, we we have this initial bound is some 20 degree. Now, we put various bounds on that and depending on that uh, the other things get to work actually. Now, now with the question is uh, how the, how it is a function of uh, grid points now. So, initially you start with the coarse grid 5 grid points only They're not good you can see some of these things are to, uh, bad looking sort of things. So, but then once you have this history in place you can use that as a guess history and then go for final grid and all that actually. So, fine uh, 5 to 10, 10 to 12, 12 to 20, 20 to 30 like that. Now, you can observe that uh, beyond 20, uh, 20 there is not much of uh, no not much of an issue. So, going beyond 20 is no point actually. Okay. So, we convert, so we take that okay, 20 grid points are good enough for the solution and we live with the 20 grid point solution basically. Okay. You can see the number of grid point versus computational time and all that. So, if you have 5 obviously, your computational time is very small they are all evaluated in this hardware settings which is a regular desktop with metal of 7.4 running and all that. It is not a dedicated processor ok, the whole idea is if you have a real a real uh, real time onboard processor with a dedicated processor all that this uh, and your program uh, is written in terms of machine level language then it can be much faster than that actually. All right. So, but even this setting we have this 5 num number of uh, grid points being 5 this is the computational time then 10, 12, 20 it starts increasing, but beyond a point is not uh, so beyond 20 we do not recommend. So, we, we freeze it here actually. So, the real time implementation in C or assembly language is expected to be much faster and hence it is we think that can implemented in real time actually. Okay. Now, what was the idea of service versus legendar? It turns out that you take service polynomial or legendar polynomial both happens to be like uh, giving us the same result actually. So, there is, there is one way or other there is no advantages per se basically that, that exercise tells that. Okay, so, this is another consistency is check also you can think about that actually. So, conclusions uh, for the missile turning problem is, uh, is like this the real hemisphere engagement is feasible. Uh, so, physically speaking in uh, the no need of dog fight provided of course, you can you can implement this uh, this high shear angle values and all that okay, this this values what you are seeing here body is delta b or shear angle the thrust control augmentation that has to be implemented. Now, that has to be seen uh, subject to that condition it is possible to see have this conclusion basically. Minimum time flight path angle reversal is feasible with the, with the realistic control force that is what we think and then promising numerical results that means, computationally they are efficient and a viable tool for optimal guidance per se and service of legendary polynomial lead to the identical results actually. So, this gives some 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 degree of confidence that pseudo spectral method can be used in various application as I told uh, before uh, there are various other things that uh, that Michael Ross, I am Ross and this group have uh, actually demonstrated. There are other groups also working on the pseudo spectral method, uh, but this team has actually demonstrated to have variety of problems and uh, including hardware implementation uh, and implementation in in international space station also. So, some of these references you can you can see for more details and my recommendation will be probably the first one ok, which appeared very recently 2012 with some sort of a very good overview of the method itself ok and from from theory to flight and all that actually. Okay, so, if you can read some of these papers, it is also written in a way that is not too much mathematically involved, whereas other papers can be little bit math, math overwhelming also basically. But this is very intuitively written, very relatively long paper, 
and summarizes the entire concept in a, in a necessary mathematics sense and all that actually. So, my strong point I mean strong recommendation is that you should uh, read this paper uh, and understand more actually. All right. So, this is uh, what I wanted to talk in this particular lecture. Uh, furthermore, on that uh, what we have developed on these ideas and all that uh, calling uh, this MPSP method and MPSC subsequent things and things like that, we will discuss in the in the in the next next lecture actually. All right. Uh, thanks a lot.